uh, to the current. Uh, this is the North Central Region Water Networks Speed Networking Webinar Series. Um, you will notice that uh, we are on a new platform. Uh, for those of you that have joined us previously, we're on Zoom where we've been on uh, Blackboard Collaborate in the past. So um, we'll be here to assist you uh, in orienting to this new platform if you have not used it before. Um, I'm sure many of you are, are Zoom savvy, but we, we want to make sure everybody has the best experience possible. Uh, I'm Rebecca Power. I am joining you from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I will be your moderator for today. Um, the North Central Region Water Network that sponsors this series is a collaboration among land grant universities uh, in the upper Midwest uh, and our partners. Uh, so um, we're happy to have you all here. I was looking back at my notes from our, our last month's webinar, and it was 63 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's about 17 degrees Celsius for those of those of you that are usually working in uh, Celsius instead of Fahrenheit. Uh, and today it is 43 degrees, which is about six degrees Celsius. So it's uh, not feeling all that spring-like, but the uh, the sun is warm and the daffodils are blooming. So I hope you all are, are uh, having, having a good spring. and uh, just to look at the state of the research. So uh, that workshop was, was just an excellent event uh, and we had a lot of great discussion as a part of it. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that now uh, with our three, uh, three of our workshop organizers. We'll, we'll talk, you know, tell you a little bit more about the workshop, how it came together and why more discussion, uh, what we found and why more discussion about nutrient uh, management in cold climates is needed. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the research gaps as well, and uh, also about best management practice were highly effective in reducing nitrogen and or phosphorus loading in the Red River Basin. Uh, so on this new platform, uh, just some tips for participants to please submit your questions for the presenters in the Q&A panel. So we'll have a dedicated Q&A session following our last presentation. Um, there is a, a Q&A icon that you should see at the bottom of your webinar screen. If you're experiencing technical issues, so not you know, webinar content related issues, please use the chat feature for that and that chat icon should also be um, accessible at the bottom of your screen. If you're having any audio issues through Zoom, there is a phone in option uh, that can be accessed by clicking the up arrow on the mute icon, uh, which should be in the lower left, I think for most of you and clicking switch to phone audio. All right. Now, on to today's presenters. So uh, we have uh, Mike L, who is the former uh, Environmental Sciences Administrator for the North Dakota, North Dakota Department of Environmental Quality and current, um, uh, current fisherman and uh, uh, proud granddad. So we're uh, great, grateful to have him back today. Uh, Jason Ram Van Robes, lead for agroecosystem resilience for agriculture and agri-food Canada. And Mitchell Timmerman, who is an agroecosystem specialist for Manitoba agriculture and resource development. Um, for this webinar, you can follow us uh, on Twitter at North Central H2O and uh, hashtag the current for live tweets and feel free to tweet yourself, uh, share with your, with your colleagues uh, what you're learning. Uh, and with that, I will jump right, jump right into um, introducing Mike Al. So uh, graduated from North Dakota State University in 1982, uh, followed by a lot of great experience um, uh, working on a diversity of, 
uh, environment and natural resource issues uh, with the North Dakota Department of Health um, and, and in other, other aspects of natural resource management. So I'll just let you just briefly scan his bio there and want to give him as much time as possible. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen uh, and turn, turn it over to Mike. Well, thank you. Can you see my screen? We can see your screen and let's click All the right. presentation mode and it uh, looks great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, as Rebecca mentioned, I am retired. I retired about two weeks after the workshop. And to be honest, this is the first thing I've done work-related in about two years. So if I'm a little rusty, please forgive me. So um, again, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to start out this webinar by providing you with an introduction to the workshop, including some background on the River River Basin, the purpose of the workshop and how the workshop was developed and organized. The Red River Basin covers an area of about 45,000 square miles and is located in North Dakota, Minnesota, a small portion in South Dakota and in Manitoba. The main stem Red River of the North is formed by the confluences of the Bois de Sioux and Ottertail Rivers near Wapaton, North Dakota. It then flows north between North Dakota and Minnesota into Canada, where it empties into Lake Winnipeg. While the Red River represents an average of 17% of the inflow to Lake Winnipeg, it is estimated that it contributes almost 75% or 70% 70 of the phosphorus load and 34% of the nitrogen load to Lake Winnipeg. Climate in the Red River Basin is diverse with significant gradients in both precipitation and temperature. Land use in the basin is also diverse and includes agricultural crops, wetlands, grasslands predominantly in the western part of the basin, and forests in the eastern part of the basin. While most people think of the Red River Basin in terms of the Red River Valley, Major crops are grown throughout the, the basin include corn, soybeans, and spring wheat. Other crops include canola, sugar beets, dry beans, and potatoes. The largest urban areas are located on the Red River main stem and include Fargo-Moorhead, Grand Forks, East Grand Forks, and Winnipeg. Another unique characteristic of the Red River Basin is that it is governed by two federal agencies, three states, in one province. Also included within the basin are a number of tribal reservations in the US and First Nations in Canada. This international feature of the Red River Basin means it is also under the jurisdiction of the International Joint Commission, which was formed by the Boundary Waters Treaty Act of 1909. With respect to the Red River Basin, the International Red River Board was created to make recommendations to the IJC on basin activities that affect transboundary water quantity and quality. Regarding issues of water quality, the International Red River Board created a water quality committee consisting of staff representing state, provincial, and federal agencies with jurisdiction in the basin. In addition to reporting on IJC water quality objectives for the Red River, the water quality committee was tasked by the board with developing a nutrient management strategy for the Red River and the basin. I should also point out that this strategy recognizes Lake Winnipeg. Among the components of the International River River Board's nutrient management strategy, two components stood out in terms of understanding the effectiveness of BMP implementation, especially in cold climates like the Red River Basin. These were the need to identify priority areas for BMP implementation, and to identify actions for achieving reductions in nutrient loading in cold climates. It was during discussions of these components that the committee agreed that a workshop to discuss and reach consensus on nutrient reduction BMPs in a cold climate region like the Red River Basin was needed. So what makes 
a cold climate different? One is a short growing season, which limits agronomic options for farmers and time available for BMP implementation. Another characteristic is that pre precipitation falls as both rain and snow, with snow melt being a significant part of annual runoff in many years. Snow melt runoff also uniquely affects how water accumulates and moves in, form, in the forms of nutrients in runoff, which is also affected by freeze thaw events in the spring. Besides the challenge of implementing BMPs among multiple jurisdictions in the Red River Basin, there are the physical challenges of an area which is relatively flat with fine textured soils in an area that has been intensively drained and is seeing more and more subsurface drainage. It's with this background that we went about developing the workshop with the first planning committee meeting on June 29th, 2017. There were seven people on the first call with the group quickly expanding to 40 people consisting of state, provincial and federal agency staff University Extension staff and researchers, soil and water conservation districts, and commodity groups. Also, the planning committee included staff with the River Basin Commission and the North Central Region Water Network who provided organizational support to the committee. A key component of organizing the workshop was to clearly define its purpose which was to review and explore the available research on nutrient reduction BMP effectiveness in northern cold climates and to develop consensus recommendations on BMP effectiveness. To achieve this purpose, workshop objectives were to explore and discuss pertinent research regarding BMPs, identify gaps in our understanding of BMPs, especially as they pertain to their application in cold climate regions like the River River Basin, and to develop a report documenting the discussion and areas of consensus, both in terms of what BMPs work and those Mason characteristics, just to get everybody familiar and on the same page in terms of cold climates and the river basin. Following this background information, the workshop participants tackled the topic of nutrient reduction BMPs. To do this, BMPs were organized into five categories with two to four presentations associated with each BMP category. The five BMP categories were nutrient management, nutrient transport reduction, vegetative BMPs, structural BMPs, and finally a discussion on integrating BMPs and BMPs which will address multiple resource concerns in the basin. Following each set of BMP category presentations, the workshop participants were asked to join breakout groups where the groups were tasked to gather as much information as possible on the BMPs discussed, including making recommendations on consensus, BMP priorities, and research needs. I would also like to point out that two technical writers were hired to compile the final report. Dr. David Mulla with the University of Minnesota was tasked with summarizing nitrogen reduction BMPs and David Wetter with Agri-Earth Consulting located in Winnipeg, Manitoba summarized BMP recommendations for phosphorus. In closing, I wanna thank the members of the workshop planning committee for their guidance and support in helping to organize the workshop and for also providing review and comment on the final report and fact sheets. I would also like to thank the 90 people who presented and participated in the workshop. Also, thanks go to Ted Priester with the River Basin Commission and Rebecca Powers and Ann Nardi with the North Central Water 
Legion Water Network for their support during the planning process and during the workshop. The workshop was also a success due to its location. Therefore, I would like to thank the University of Minnesota Crookston and Linda Kingery for hosting the workshop. Finally, I wanna thank all of the sponsors who provided funding for the workshop and report, including support from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada, who also provided funding for the report. And that concludes the introduction. I will turn it over. Thank you, Mike. And um, special thanks to Mike for his vision uh, in really making sure this workshop was a, happened um, and, and gathering us all together uh, and, and keeping us on track and really um, engaging uh, a diversity of folks, the, all the folks that needed to be at the table to make it successful. So, and thanks for coming back to help us here and taking a break from from your fishing. Actually, uh, that bass I showed in the picture was caught right at the end of that dock. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like a great place to be. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, go ahead and share my screen again and um, introduce Jason Van Robes. So uh, Jason uh, is, it really took the ball and continued to run with it uh, after Mike decided to go fishing. So um, thanks Jason for, for all of your hard work. So um, you can see uh, his educational background there. He's worked for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada since 2000 and has been at the Morden Research and Development Center in Manitoba since 2006. And he's bringing, you know, bringing a wealth of experience to this conversation. Um, and he's currently the lead for the Agrosystem Resilience in the Living Laboratories Division of the Science and Technology Branch. So with that, um, Jason, thank you. I will stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Just uh, share my presentation. Just if someone would just give me a thumbs up that they can see it, that'd be appreciated. Thanks, Rebecca. So, okay, so uh, and again, just wanna mention a uh, big thanks to Mike for uh, coming back and doing such a great job of giving us that overview of the background of the present or the uh, workshop, why we did it, how we did it and all that. So nobody could have done it better. So thanks again, Mike, for coming back and doing that. So I'm just gonna uh, pick up um, the ball where Mike left off and talk a little bit more about the results of the workshop and really key in on um, the content of a report that was developed that, that attempted to summarize all of that great information and uh, discussions that were had over that two-day workshop. So uh, Mike mentioned already, uh, you know, the, the group of participants and organizing committee that helped organize the workshop. And he also mentioned the two lead authors of the report, but I'll just mention them again, David Wetter and uh, Dr. David Mulla. Uh, that really did the bulk of the writing and uh, thank goodness they were at the workshop and took such great notes and were able to do such a good job in writing up the report. But I also want to uh, extend a shout out to a little subcommittee that was formed shortly after the workshop that I have on the screen here that was really tasked with working with the two authors to uh, make the most of the report and make sure all the discussions and uh, everything from the workshop were encompassed within that report. So I won't uh, go through all the names, but you see uh, from the list here on, on the screen, we had great representation from the different jurisdictions, um, agencies, uh, academia, um, state and federal uh, governments as well, uh, as well as uh, the Red River Basin Commission, uh, universities of Wisconsin, Minnesota, North Dakota, Manitoba. Um, so really the, the work that, uh, that I'm presenting or the results here are, are this group here, the co-authors and the subcommittee and, and all their great work. So I'm going to talk now uh, for the, the rest of uh, my portion here about the report itself. So um, the report uh, was finished off just uh, about, six, about six months ago, October 2020. Um, and uh, extensive, you know, discussion, time to prepare the report, but uh, really a great document, um, very comprehensive covering off the workshop. 
In fact, I think it's about 120, 123 pages with the appendices, so lots of information in there. And again, a big thanks to the Red River Basin Commission. You'll see the link on the bottom of this uh, slide here for downloading this report that I will speak to today. So and I'll, I'll share that again at the end if, uh, if you miss it. So, uh, so yeah, so the next uh, part of, of my talk will focus on the report, as I mentioned, and I just have up here on the screen the, the general contents of the report. Mike already did, did a great job summarizing kind of the, the basin characteristics, what's unique about it. Uh, but also within the report were great summaries of all the presentations and the breakout sessions from throughout the workshop. So I'll talk a little bit about the results from those. Um, and then I'll focus a little bit at the end on the idea of the research gaps that were identified and try to real quickly summarize them. But as it's such a big report, I'll just say, I'll just touch on some high level points from within the workshop, but really uh, encourage everyone to, to have a closer look at the actual report to get all the details. So uh, sections four, five, and six, kind of the middle midsection of the report dealt with uh, summarizing all the presentations and the breakouts. So they're summarized by nitrogen and by BMP category, and then by phosphorus and BMP category, and a separate section on the idea and concept related to stacking or integrating the different BMPs together. So that's, uh, yeah, the bulk of the, the midsection of the report. Then I'll touch a little bit on the next part of the report that did a great job of summarizing really the heart of the discussion around the BMPs. And as was mentioned, which ones were kind of had good uh, consensus on which ones were effective and which ones were identified as maybe not having that great consensus and maybe more, more research or studies required. So within this report, uh, this was really separated into two main tables, again, one for nitrogen and one for phosphorus. I know you can't see the details of these tables uh, on the slide, but the next few slides I have will kind of zoom in on this and what it's all about. So I'll talk a little bit about the, the structure and the content of these tables that kind of summarize the heart of what was discussed at the workshop. So in terms of the BMP summaries table, uh, this slide just shows you the structure of the tables and what was incorporated into these, these tables. So the first part of it, the, the, the columns on the left side of the table, really just summarize the different BMPs, the category of the BMP, a description of it, and even some reference to CRP numbers or NRCS uh, practice codes as well, just to kind of describe the, the categories of the different BMPs and the description of the specific BMP within that category. So the next part here I've kind of highlighted in, in blue or that column is a, is a table associated, uh, or sorry, a column associated with the level of consensus that was reached during the workshop. So whether it was a strong consensus, we've got a lot, lots of agreement, or whether the consensus wasn't as strong, a little bit weaker. In other words, there was differing opinions or uncertainty really related to how these BMPs perform in this region, in this cold, cold climate. The next part of it looked at not just the consensus, but whether that consensus was that they were highly effective, not that effective, or whether the consensus was that it was really still uncertain about what that effectiveness for the BMPs were. So that's the column here I highlighted in green. I know you can't read this, but I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit later to show you some of the results. And the last part of these tables uh, highlighted specifically related to that certain BMP, what limitations or research gaps were mentioned or highlighted as part of the workshop. So now I'll just jump in and zoomed in to, you know, not all of the tables summarizing the different BMPs, but I will show you the ones that we had put together uh, for the report for the phosphorus section. Um, and I'll have just a few slides summarizing the different BMP categories here. So this particular slide shows the, like I said, the BMP summary table for phosphorus with focused in on the nutrient management category of the different BMPs. So this shows the different BMPs under that category. And then you'll see on the right-hand side, the, um, 
the rating or the value that we came up with along with the, the authors in terms of what that workshop consensus level was and what the agreed upon effectiveness was for that specific BMP for, in this case, phosphorus. So what you'll see from the nutrient management BMP is that there was, for the most part, pretty good, strong consensus that most nutrient management type BMPs would be effective for um, reducing nutrient losses for phosphorus um, in, in this climate, in this region. But there was a couple of discrepancies here, and that had to do with variable rate application of phosphorus, maybe some weak consensus and some uncertain effectiveness uh, related to that. So that's one aspect that might look, uh, we might look at more closely for future research or future study. And then the idea of inhibitors and slow release fertilizers and, and split applications, that wasn't really discussed for phosphorus. It was discussed more for nitrogen. So we just referenced that in the table that this was not discussed. So moving quite quickly through this, hopefully we'll have time afterwards for a little bit of discussion or for some questions. But now the next slide just shows the uh, erosion control category of BMPs, again, for phosphorus. And here we'll see a little bit more uncertainty related to these different practices or that there wasn't a, a real strong consensus about their effectiveness. So things like conservation tillage, windbreaks, shelter belts, snow fences, living snow fences, lots of uncertainty around those ones and contour farming as well. And I think some of that has to do with some of the recent uh, research around conservation or reduced tillage and the potential to release more phosphorus uh, from those practices. And maybe just a lack of studies related to shelter belts and windbreaks and contour farming in this region. So a lot of uncertainty around those practices. The next slide just summarizes all the practices we had categorized under vegetation or crop residue management. And you'll see here, you'll, the, the general gist of this particular category was a lot of weak consensus or a lot of uncertainty around these vegetative practices. A lot of the research discussed at the workshop pointed to the potential for vegetation as it decomposes and breaks down to be a potential source of nutrients, especially phosphorus. So that's why you'll see a lot of uncertainty or weak consensus for these types of practices. The last category of BMPs I'll quickly touch on is the structural practices. And a lot of these are the, you know, the engineered practices like uh, those related to tile drainage, ditches, uh, water retention ponds, uh, waskobs, um, and those type of things. So generally a lot more strong consensus that most of them were highly effective, especially if you store and capture water and reduce runoff leaving your field, there was pretty good consensus that those would be effective. Just a few in here related to tile drainage, uh, drainage water management, end of pipe treatment like bioreactors, two-stage ditches, and the nutrient-rich sediment removal from water retention ponds. Those ones had some uncertainty or potential low effectiveness. So some of these types of practices will require further research and study in, in this basin. Just real high level overview, a summary of, of all these, these tables. In a general sense, those practices that had strong science, strong support and high effectiveness, but only site specific in nature were those erosion control practices. Those that had more broad, uh, support on the science and effectiveness were, like I said, those nutrient management practices, and in a general sense, those structural practices that capture and minimize the runoff leaving the fields. And in a general sense, those that had weak science or uncertain effectiveness, generally those related to vegetation and uh, crop residues, windbreaks, shelter belts, and some of those tile drainage BMPs. So just real quickly, a couple of slides here to wrap up on the research gap section, section seven of the report, again, categorized by nutrients, either nitrogen, phosphorus, or both. And then again, summarized by the BMP categories. So this section of the report, uh, lots of information in here. Again, I'm just going to touch on it high level in the next slide, but I encourage uh, the audience here to look further at this section within the report itself. 
So here's just a high level summary of some of the maybe the key messages from the research gaps we identified. So there's still a need to improve our understanding of the hydrology and how nutrients are transported and leaving our farm fields in these climates and how that those processes impact BMP performance here. So the seasonality, um, a lot of research done in warmer climates similar to our summer season, but what's happening with these BMPs outside that growing season in that really important snow melt or spring runoff event season, and then even the fall season once the vegetation stops growing, once we have more cultivated acres and the crops are, are no longer growing as well. I'll just key real quickly on the, the form of the nutrient, the, the concept that um, particulate versus dissolved nutrients. This has a big impact on how effective some of these BMPs might be and, and more research needed to figure out just how important or how prevalent is that dissolved form and does that indeed cause limitations on the performance for, for nutrient reduction. Uh, further practices, edge of field, in field, those related to tile drainage, a lot more tile going into the ground up here and that uh, definitely is a, a point requiring further study. We also wanted to mention we focused on nutrients here, but we recognize there's lots of other great benefits and the tr or, and or trade-offs for some of these BMPs. And we have to acknowledge that and maybe do more research to understand and quantify what some of those trade-offs might be. Soil health, flood mitigation, you'll see them on the, the slide here. Climate and climate change, you know, is our environment up here going to become more like those a little bit further south? Some people have referenced Manitoba or southern Manitoba will be more like Iowa in the future. So does that mean more extremes? Does that mean less importance of the snowmelt uh, runoff in the spring? So just some examination of climate change was brought up. And the idea also of not only doing research or using sites for research, but also to demonstrate and try to find sites in this area that are representative of the different regions, the different landscapes, the different climates, the different soil types, all that kind of thing, and use them for demonstration and extension purposes. So kind of in closing, just to wrap up before I hand it off to, to Mitch to, uh, to finish off here, um, just an opportunity really to, to build on the momentum of the workshop and this idea of potentially creating a, a research network to try to address some of those key gaps that, uh, that are in that report. And moving towards coordinated experiments, compatible data sets across the region, uh, across the borders, uh, finding those representative sites and cooperating on uh, sharing results and extension activities. And I've just thrown up some examples here of some ongoing or, or planned initiatives throughout the basin on both sides of the border that we could tap into and maybe start to build, build this research network and continue the momentum we had from that great workshop back in 2019. So I won't go, go through them all, but there's lots of good uh, activities underway that uh, hopefully we can tap into and definitely interested uh, to hear more about potential opportunities or interest from individuals who might want to collaborate on this type of a research network. So that's all I have. So I just want to just put another plug in for the um, workshop materials, the presentations and webinars and videos uh, at the link at the top here. Uh, thanks to the University of Minnesota for that. And again, a plug for the Red River Basin Commission website and where to access this uh, report. So that's all I have. So uh, I'll turn it over to you now, Rebecca. Thank you, Jason. And yeah, obviously that was a, it's a lot of information to summarize and we're just giving you a tease here. That's why we call it a speed networking webinar. So you can like get, just get a taste of what there is uh, for this report to, to offer. And now uh, I'm gonna share my screen again and uh, introduce Mitchell. Uh, Mitch is going to talk to us about uh, some of the fact sheets that will help synthesize this information and some other next steps. So um, Mitch is uh, an agroecosystem specialist for Manitoba Agriculture and Resources Development. Um, he's a systems person, as you can see, and uh, also has a a pr uh, comes from a proud uh, farming family. So thank you, 
Mitch for joining us and I'm just going to make it quick to give you as much time as possible and stop sharing my screen so you can share yours. All righty. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to participate, contribute uh, like the other fellows. I haven't seen the, I'm sorry, Rebecca, I haven't seen the prompt yet to, am I to click anything? No, you've just empowered me, haven't you? If okay, you look good. in the lower part of your screen, yep, there should be a share screen button and you should be good to go. Okay, okay, good. All right. All right, can you see a PowerPoint slide now? Not yet. Not yet, all right. Uh, second attempt. Mm -hmm. And I am not seeing the, I'm sorry, can you redirect me to the accept, accept the power to present button yep. because I'm not seeing it. Yep, so if you look in the lower portion of your screen and scroll down, you should see a green share screen. Button. Oh my goodness, it was partially obscured by something else on my screen. I see it now, thank you. There we yes. are. And now I'll go to, uh, yes. PowerPoint and tell me, am I live? Is it live now, Rebecca? It is. And you have Excellent. me to present. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, once again, good afternoon, everyone. This will be uh, what should be a quick wrap of uh, what was an excellent opening two parts to the presentation by the other fellows. Uh, Jason's provided a great uh, segue to mine, uh, what I'll be discussing next steps, and uh, I'll also be alluding to some of the content I think that, uh, that Mike presented in his portion of today's show. In Forging a Path Forward, I've identified uh, three steps, three types of activities. One is extension, and uh, Jason's already covered that uh, to some degree uh, with respect to, uh, or to quite a, a bit of detail, but in terms of um, a next step, the report is an obvious outcome to extend in great detail. Uh, after extension, uh, I'm suggesting that the, the next, uh, another next step is to establish what will be uh, uh, the subsequent theme to pursue should uh, another event be held, a similar event, or regardless of whether a, uh, another major gathering is orchestrated, uh, there is what uh, Jason was describing in his final slide, and that is the, uh, the pursuit of more and better collaboration across the basin. In terms of extension, the workshops, deliberations, and outcomes, the final report obviously provides uh, those uh, details uh, for, for those who wish to delve into them. And uh, Jason is providing that navigation to the web location. Uh, the other major piece in the way of uh, publications is a series of fact sheets. Uh, two are pretty much ready to go. They are in my uh, brief description and overview uh, synopsis document for the workshop. And that uh, relates a lot to uh, what Mike described in part one of today's webinar. And uh, then some of the, uh, the specific details that Jason described in part two. Uh, the second fact sheet that's uh, pretty much good to go is uh, one addressing research gaps centering on what must be uh, or what is at least recommended as uh, area of focus or areas of focus in the way of drumming up new knowledge and then finally uh, one that uh, is uh, definitely at the draft stage and that is the the third fact sheet to address uh, what, again, Mike did a good job of describing, that is the uniqueness of the Red River Basin, and of course, uh, the context of that of, of a cold climate and uh, attempting to address water quality objectives through agricultural BMPs with those particular factors, those constraints. All right, that's extension, uh, then further on forging a path uh, ahead from uh, the Crookston workshop, implementation. 
And uh, this relates to uh, Mike's mention of the uh, invitation to growers, to farmers, to producers to participate next time. And that could take the form of uh, circumstances allowing a, uh, a, another face-to-face -face gathering, a workshop of, of some kind, uh, invitation and uh, trying to gather the right minds uh, to further the conversation and move from the question of efficacy of BMPs to implementation. And uh, related to that, uh, in establishing the, the next theme of uh, as that of being implementation, it's, it's also recognizing, and this is stated in the report, part of the important fine print, so to speak, is what needs to be accomplished in advance of that. And uh, one of the fact sheets is also going to mention that, and that is to acknowledge uh, what folks like myself and others involved and, and a lot of those in attendance, uh, the type of role that we have. Uh, and uh, that relates to my, my next item here, implementation of a different though related uh, sort. And that is of all the various players in this drama, their roles are, are different and they're all uh, in uh, pursuit of, of that, uh, that goal of BMP adoption. Implementation, naturally, one would think presumably first of farmers. Uh, that's the, the picture painted in the mind of the farmers then actually doing something differently or better. But of course, uh, for example, my, myself uh, working for a provincial ministry what is the challenge to government is, is a, a profound question to enable that implementation, to remove obstacles, to smooth that path for farmers, to implement BMPs. It's not as though even once the science is in place, uh, there are, uh, that that's the end of it. There are other uh, measures to be considered, to be undertaken. And for example, in government, uh, in my position, uh, my role is primarily threefold. It's extension, incentive programming, and regulatory support. And thus, if I was to focus on incentive programming, I could pose the question, well, uh, is the way that we're offering uh, cost share incentives to farmers effective? Uh, is there a different way to do it? Should we be focusing more on a, a tech transfer approach uh, and uh, an R&D kind of thing for uh, the less desirable or the uh, BMPs, the, the practices that are less readily adopted to farmers that perhaps less relate uh, less to the bottom line. And maybe that's, that's something that government has to uh, tackle uh, in order to facilitate the, the progress forward and, and this, this next step in, in engaging farmers. And then uh, feasibility criteria are of course critical for implementing BMPs at various scales, and uh, these criteria go well beyond what was the focus of the workshop, and uh, they were alluded to by my esteemed colleagues earlier. Here's my way of representing them, and of course, uh, those who work directly with farmers or perhaps of uh, address subjects uh, such as the the uh, the economics and so forth. We are are, are quite aware. Are, are other major considerations uh, that, that farmers would weigh heavily. And uh, yes, as mentioned uh, by Jason, I think it was uh, climate change would be an obvious curveball to try to account for. In terms of thinking of implementing and of course uh, resources, whether it's incentive funding or others, uh, finite, how do we prioritize? Well, uh, for implementation to make that happen, on a scientific as well as a practicality basis, well, we can uh, take advantage of, uh, for instance, what's known from the, the report in terms of load distribution across the basin. And then as well uh, as uh, the initiative was taken by the co-authors of the report, it may be possible to apply criteria of various sorts to then determine BMP suitability zones as uh, is indicated here. And that may be a way uh, for the, the collective, uh, we to 
uh, to prioritize uh, and facilitate to enable that implementation. And thus we're moving from the question of which BMPs can be effective here in the Red River Basin uh, that uh, has all of these uh, peculiar characteristics, including the cold climate, to the question of which BMPs can be implemented here. And uh, that was something that workshop participants uh, agreed upon uh, that uh, it's important for the scientific community for this collective we I'm referring to uh, taking, taking part in this, in this webinar, for instance, to, to try to get our story as straight as possible before further engaging uh, or intensifying the engagement that we already have with the agricultural community with farmers. A quick example would be managing scented fertilizer and how, of course, farmers uh, can't uh, necessarily simply accept a recommendation such as uh, of, with respect to the four R's, for instance, right time, uh, something that may seem obvious uh, to uh, a given uh, technical uh, specialist like myself from a scientific standpoint. Well, there are lots of caveats to that and then there may even yet be some uncertainties to the science, which uh, makes it all the more interesting and uh, challenging to say something definitive. But uh, as best we can, we need to get our story straight and communicate clearly to farmers in extension and then encouraging implementation further. And finally, collaboration. Uh, again, referring back to Jason's final slide is a great segue. Uh, I think he mentioned uh, some of these examples that I'm showing on the screen and not only engaging with the ag community or engaging with uh, the research community, intensifying collaboration that way, but also at a policy level. And I've listed a couple of examples from this side of the border. And so with that, I'll leave you with uh, a further bit of imagery and uh, taking stock of the situation. I think this relates well to what uh, the other fellows presented. And that is coming to terms with the fact that it's, it's clear that even though uh, it, Ag nutrient BMPs, uh, that phrase implies, well, it's about managing nutrients, isn't it? We know that it's more than that. It's also about managing the water because the water uh, gives life, but also an, is the, uh, the conduit for uh, excess nutrients to reach our, reach our sensitive surface waters. In terms of timing context, uh, when is the right time to approach farmers about this kind of thing? Some would say never <laughs> due to various economic factors, uh, weather factors, but I would argue that if, if there's now, if, if there's never a good time as such, then why not now? And particularly in light of, as Jason alluded to, some recent weather calamities, uh, maybe farmers are all the more interested actually the, than ever in engaging with us after the extreme precipitation, both uh, rain and snow of 2019. Oh, that led to all kinds of stress on the farm, but maybe now they are the, the, the ag community is more open to engaging with us on, on BMPs, especially when there are potentially co-benefits to go along with our, our agro-environmental objectives. That's all from me, Rebecca. Back to you. Thank you so much, Mitch. Really appreciate it. Uh, and if you could stop sharing your screen. Yes, we'll just surrender, surrender control, Mitchell, <laughs> please. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, uh, and um, we're, I'm just thank you all so much for the great questions. So we're just going to dive right in here, and um, Ed is asking to uh, a little bit about um, because of the nutrient uh, nitrogen and phosphorus going into Lake Winnipeg, um, uh, does Lake Winnipeg suffer from harmful algal blooms? So I don't know if um, Jason or uh, Mitch, you want to just. Uh, mention brief, just brief, maybe just briefly uh, talk about what the situation is in Lake Winnipeg. I'll, I'll jump in real quick, but it can be really brief. And in, in other words, yes, it does have uh, algae blooms. And I don't know the exact frequency of the when and the severity, but I know that's a big concern for us. So a lot of emphasis in Canada on trying to reduce those harmful algae blooms on Lake Winnipeg. Yep. Thank you. And uh, uh, Ed also had another question about BMP stacking, and Jason, you did uh, briefly mention BMP stacking in one of your slides, but maybe if there's anything you'd like to elaborate on to make sure we all understand, you know, how the uh, full group um, was thinking about BMP stacking. 
Yeah, we didn't spend a whole lot of time on this at the workshop, but the concept is if there's BMPs that can work in concert with each other, for example, if there's a certain practice that is implemented in the field, but at certain times of the year, for example, during the spring, uh, might release more nutrients to the runoff in the spring. If you can implement some edge of field practices, for example, that would address those or capture those like a retention pond, just an example of how you might meet one objective in the field, have a trade-off, but have a different uh, BMP downstream, et cetera, to, to help uh, meet multiple objectives, I guess, or how they can really work more effectively together. And then even further downstream at a watershed outlet or in a stream or a creek, just uh, combining those practices so that they will uh, work most effectively together and maybe meet multiple objectives, I think. Yep, thank you, Jason. Um, and uh, I, Paul, Paul, you know, uh, Mitch, you talked about a number of different weather events um, that really were um, no good for a lot of reasons. And Paul is bringing up wind. Um, so do you think that any conservation tillage and wind breaks might rank more highly today uh, based on some of those wind issues? In brief, Rebecca, we certainly do care about erosion. Uh, we don't like to see it happening. We're certainly uh, discouraging any unnecessary tillage and, and encouraging uh, more conservation tillage practices and so forth. But the quick short message on uh, nutrient delivery to surface waters and the, the impacts that follow, uh, erosion in this basin with this cold climate uh, barring climate change, of course, uh, or uh, speaking ahead of what climate change is going to throw at us, because we have nearly level landscapes, uh, we, we have a dry climate overall, the role of spring snow melt. Again, it's not as though we don't care about erosion, but in terms of a uh, identifying the dominant mechanism uh, for how nutrients, especially dissolve, uh, phosphorus, and especially in the dissolved form, reaches surface waters, uh, we have we have bigger fish to fry. By the same token, uh, we care about all our resources, and uh, this is part of that systems approach or stacking of BMPs and accepting trade offs that we would uh, we would of course want to engage with farmers on a site specific basis because I come from hilly land, and occasionally there is catastrophic erosion there associated with water, uh, and so it it comes down to the site specific conditions to to prioritize th that pathway higher. Hey, this is Mike, if I may add to that um, topic of wind erosion. I, th I think it was raised um, and discussed and was um, kind of recognized as a pretty significant research need in terms of wind erosion in the winter, especially in the, the valley floor with those uh, you know fine textured soils and just the mechanism by which soil, uh, which you know, can blow off fields, uh, accumulate in ditches, and then be transported uh, downstream. Um, it was kind of anecdotally uh, discussed, but I think it is a research need that that was recognized. Yeah, great point, Mike. Thank you for um, rounding out that answer. Um, Normally I go in order, but I want to get to a, a question that Paul or a comment that Paul Hay is um, bringing up because I think it'd be good to have you all speak to this. So he's, you know, saying it uh, sad that no-till soil health cover crops variable rate application are largely ignored or discounted, um, and he talks about the potential for these to be a win-win. And I just, you know, I th I think um, that there was definitely not a, a discounting um, in, in, in the group and wanted to give, because this was really um, looking at research consensus. So anyway, I'll let you, you all uh, talk about that uh, nuance and the really importance of that question that Paul is raising um, to maybe help us clarify, clarify that. I can jump in there, Rebecca, if you like, and let the others uh, add, add where I, where I missed something, but uh, a lot of interest up here as well in, in improving soil health, cover crops, um, those type of practices and, and things like reduced tillage, a lot of other benefits related to reduced tillage, even, even nitrogen reduction, but there, 
there has is some research that suggests maybe more phosphorus might be leaving some of those fields. But I think the challenge for us, and we put uh, soil health and those related practices like cover crops high on our list to study to understand better. There, Mitch, jump in here, but from my perspective, cover crops are little researched, but not a real common practice yet. But uh, as we get more vegetation on the land related to cover crops and potentially more vegetation leading into that snowmelt period, there is some potential for more releases of nutrients as a result. So those are the reasons why we certainly recognize the interest and the support from other aspects, but I think we need to research the impact on, on nutrient losses. Agreed. I guess for me, um, that potential conflict uh, between you know, the perception that things like cover crops, conservation tillage, um, you know, those types of practices uh, benefit water quality from a nutrient standpoint. Uh, and then the research that was coming out predominantly from Manitoba that suggested it also provides a pathway for soluble phosphorus uh, really was kind of a main motivator for trying to organize this workshop because producers were getting mixed messages in terms of what works and what doesn't work. And for me, it kind of was my motivation for let's let's try to get the science right on BMPs before we, you know, um, go too far in making recommendations on BMPs that we believe reduce nutrients when in fact we may find that they contribute nutrients. So um, there is there is um, some controversy in terms of, of of some of the BMPs that are being applied that certainly have soil health benefits, have other benefits in terms of, of reducing soil erosion, but, but may contribute nutrients. Sorry, Rebecca, just real quickly, I'd love to see more of these type of sites. And we have a few worked, worked on in Manitoba, but more of these type of sites that are combining research related to cover crops, tillage, et cetera, and get that network of sites to better understand what's happening with these in this region, for sure. Yeah, thanks, thanks all. And that's not to say, of course, like when individual farmers or land managers are, are managing their sites, you know, and, and monitoring that, of course, that information is valuable and, you know, you're paying attention to what's happening on your land. And this is a summary of, you know, what we know uh, from the research that we hope can inform uh, land management decisions. Um, okay, uh, and uh, Jet, we're gonna maybe go a couple minutes over here, I think. Uh, for, yep, I'm seeing nods from some of yeah, you. Thank you. Um, just to make sure we get some of these questions uh, answered. So Jess, was there any research mentioned involving mycorrhizal uh, fungi in phosphorus and phosphorus reduction in buffers? Yeah, good question. I don't recall that discussion at the workshop anyways. No, I don't that, that's, yeah, uh, yeah a quick uh, comment. Yeah, that's one of those interesting, hmm, that's highly relevant over here regarding phosphorus fertility and crop rotation, what crops form associations with the microbes to then affect phosphorus availability. And so it's it's relevant, but it, it's quite tangential, I think, and that's why it was not included that I recall either. Thanks for raising that, Jess. And yeah, certainly interest. And it uh, looks like uh, some more uh, research needed there. OK, um, got BMP stacking. All right. Uh, when considering BMP effectiveness for, N, uh, for phosphorus, any differentiation made, made between particulate P and dissolved P? Quickly, I'll just say, yeah, especially if uh, some of that aspect of, of site specific nature. So if you're seeing a lot of water erosion uh, on a field, it's likely you're going to have high particulate P. So some of those uh, points that we made about consensus, if particulate P is the prevalent form, then some of these practices might be 
uh, more effective. So that's that site specific nature to understand a little bit better uh, what the form of that nutrient is and how these BMPs might uh, perform based on that type of nutrient. Agreed, that was a, a critical aspect that the chemistry, Jason, comes into play big time because of course, yes, we've already faced that question here, validly put forward, hey, you're telling me conservation tillage is bad and these other sites are practicing, what am I doing here? This, this is bad for the lake? Well, the, the, we've not only recently relatively come to terms with this complexity of the, the chemistry, the forms of the phosphorus. And yes, it's going to mean people like, like me, Jason, maybe not you if you're focusing on collecting the data, but people like me in extension, yes, it's a heck of a, a tango to dance with a farmer to try to give a straight direct answer and not sound like I'm coming across as dismissing or bad mouthing certain practices that offer benefits, but are they other benefits? Are they economic, agronomic, some environmental, but which environmental? It's, it's going to be a lot like what I've heard about managing phosphorus fertility from uh, Dr. Flayton, for instance, is it's a conversation. It's not a, here's the recommendation, do it this way, don't do it that way. Thank you both. Um... And for those of you, I'll just say for those of you that need to leave, uh, we really do appreciate you joining. Um, I'm gonna do our closing slide as soon as we're done with questions, but just if you do need to leave, thank you so much. And we've so appreciated having you here today. Uh, with that, uh, Scott has a question uh, based on one of the recent answers about erosion in general, is most of the phosphorus loss uh, through subsurface drainage, uh, particular through subsurface drainage, particulate and dissolved P. Jason, mm -hmm. I tend to defer to you as you've noticed so far on the heavy science, the heavy lifting science question. So why don't you start? I'll chime in only as necessary. Yeah, and, and you can jump in here for sure. And others can, I'm sure too, about the, the prevalence of, of subsurface flow, whether it's through tile or not. But some of the maps that we showed um, illustrated the some of the characteristics of the basin that make surface runoff dominant in a lot of the watersheds and tributaries. So the flat, uh, heavy soiled, heavy clay landscapes mean for the bulk of the basin, probably the predominant pathway is surface. And there are pockets, at least in Manitoba, I can speak to where tile drainage is becoming more prevalent in some of those lighter soils that would increase the subsurface pathway and that's growing but predominantly based on the characteristics it's mostly surface uh, pathways at least I can speak to most of Manitoba but jump jump in Mitch. No that's a great overview uh, synopsis Jason I'll simply add that yes my familiarity with uh, the research that has been done here I wouldn't dare say call it exhaustive, but considerable and quite revealing collaborating with collaboration between the U of Manitoba, U of Waterloo, Lobb, McRae, uh, one site in particular, yes, but that is the conclusion. Surface flows remain dominant. And uh, yes, uh, this means it's a, it's a discussion of, of the, the form. Is it uh, snow is the precipitation leading to snow melt? Uh, will the tiles have any influence in a given, in a typical year, whatever that is, if the ground's frozen, because again, we're back to cold climate. You mentioned topography, uh, the artificial surface drainage being so dominant, and the fact that the, the tiles, yes, based on, on soil and timing, uh, can't play the role that they do in other regions, such as those uh, folks on the call are quite familiar with Wisconsin, and, uh, for example, uh, where the proportion is flipped between surface and subsurface uh, flow dominance. And then that relates again to form of phosphorus. Thank you both. Um, Scott asked, oh no, I'm sorry, that was done. Albert, uh, there, and we've already touched on this a little bit, but uh, Albert's asking about, you know, talking about the Emphasis on cover, cover crops further south and the weak consensus in the north. Anything more folks want to say about why um, we're seeing more maybe weak evidence for cover crop value in the north? 
Well, let me let me just clarify that, like the, that the research is, um, you know, like still there's some TBD in the research. Maybe is how I'll I'll uh, rephrase that. I'll just real quick. There, there's not a lot of cover crops being used here. We're still trying to study how to get them uh, established in the, the short time period we have, for example, after crops are harvested. So it's not a real common practice, but then then combining the fact that we don't have a lot of research edge of field runoff losses is where those cover crops are, you know, those few places that they are. So there's not a lot of research up here, but it's it's pretty high on the list of, of areas to study. Yes, it's twofold. As Mike mentioned earlier, there is the agronomic limitation of the cold climate and uh, then other factors, crop rotation, farmers familiarity and so forth. Compared to other places, it's, it's just darn difficult to start growing cover crops here uh, because the, the window of opportunity can be so much shorter, such as in 2019. Uh, here with the, the rain and snow in September and October. And then on top of that, yes, there is this clear trade-off between protecting the soil, improving soil health, protecting soil from erosion. I mean, for instance, more roots in the ground, good stuff, residue on the surface, but oh no, now we have this source of dissolved phosphorus that because of cold climate, when the cover crop can be grown, will that actually increase the, the total yield or the yield of the nastiest kind of phosphorus, most impactful, yeah, the, these are the, the struggles of the, the cover crop question, but we're far from giving up. The U of M is leading a project. Dr. Yvonne Lawley would be a good contact for anyone interested. Great, thank you. Um, super helpful explanation, really appreciate that. Um, and I hope Albert, you felt the same way. Uh, so Ed asks, uh, with regenerative, uh, well, I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna skip to one of other Ed's questions. Is there any hard, quote, hard data to accompany the weak high ratings in terms of nutrient pounds removed per acre or kilograms per hectare for each BMP? Real quick on that, there is references in the presentation material from the experts who presented. So there will be, at least in some cases, uh, quantification of, of those losses associated with those BMPs from the presenters, and that's within the report, uh, if you want to delve into that further. Yep, thank you. Um, anything else about uh, data collection efforts moving forward in the Red River Basin to better define efficacy and cost effectiveness for these practices? Well, I can give the one example. I'm serving a modest advisory role on a, a U of Minnesota coordinated 4R, and I mentioned the slide, 4R plus drainage project, and uh, others can uh, speak to that much much better than I in terms of relating it to, um, to existing work and so forth. But uh, multiple sites, coordination, it's that collaboration across the basin that I mentioned in, in my part of the webinar, Rebecca. And uh, yes, the, the outstanding item from a project like that will be the economics because there is no uh, PhD in uh, farm economics on that research team, uh, unless uh, Jason is Yaba holding out on us and maybe he has that, uh, that port in his portfolio. And that's, that's going, again, Rebecca, back to, yes, this, um, this uh, path we're on and the stepwise, the jerkiness progress on it it uh, of course will be a, a valid tough question from farmers. Hey, is this affordable to do? Or how do I take this into account in my farm's ec uh, model, economic model, revenue streams and on and on. And uh, yes, uh, uh, that, that's a separate question necessarily from a, 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 a hydrology soils nutrient fate study. Jason? Yeah, real quickly, we, we are doing some work uh, within our living laboratories initiative. Um, where we are looking at uh, water retention practices, trying to uh, incorporate construction costs over time, uh, opportunity costs related to land values, et cetera. That's one of the practices where there was some pretty strong consensus that those are effective practices. So we are trying to look at some cost benefit analysis for that type of practice. And a lot of that will look at where are the best or strategic places to put those practices to minimize the costs and especially opportunity costs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
And I will say there, you know, there are uh, University of Minnesota and uh, you know others are certainly trying to do more to collect financial uh, data on how these conservation practices work in a farm balance sheet. Um, I'm sure that's happening uh, in Manitoba as well. But just to say, you know, yes, those uh, efforts are ongoing. And one of the challenges is that we we need more financial data in a form that we can aggregate to help us understand um, the cost effectiveness part of this equation. So def definitely there's work in that arena. Yes, I can give one quick example of a BMP that to my knowledge, Jason wouldn't have any economic value to the farmer in its current form, and that's a bioreactor, an edge of field filter of some kind. What's in it for the farmer? Well, to my knowledge, there isn't. And that's, again, circling back to what I mentioned about incentive programming, government support, farmer versus societal benefit. Uh, this is all part of that conversation, practice by practice. Okay, finishing up here, uh, just a quick question from uh, Cheryl. Did the workshop address BMPs and potential groundwater contamination? didn't really delve into groundwater contamination to the best of my knowledge. There was an overview of geology and, and uh, some of that related to groundwater, but the focus I believe was more on surface water contamination. That's my quick answer. Yes, it would have been indirect, Jason, naturally, like we do with a lot of things, connecting dots. Oh, we're focused on this, but actually phosphorus, for instance. Oh, by the way, though, nitrogen. Oh, are we talking nitrate and then leaching potentially? Sure, but it though that would be yeah tangential at best to use that word again. Yes, uh, it was definitely a, a focus on surface water quality. Yeah, and, and that was recall, a oh Mike, yeah, thanks. Go I ahead. I was just going to say that was the decision that the planning committee made early on too was to focus on surface water. Yep. So in some cases we have evidence of nitrogen loss, but we didn't um, uh, uh, make that link to where we were losing it to groundwater. Um, so that's another important um, issue to keep in mind. Okay, um, so, and Tyler, uh, uh, maybe I'm gonna ask, uh, because we're gonna cut the, nut, the questions here just to make sure we can finish up and maybe if um, someone can answer Tyler's question uh, via typing in the Q&A. Um, but I'll just, uh, Ed's final question with regenerative ag being such a buzzword these days is another research data gap in the dynamics of, uh, carbon, uh, soil carbon with nitrogen and phosphorus export and losses. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Talk about taking on another subject area. Yes. And that's why uh, it was great. You alluded to that, Rebecca, the systems concept, right? I've embraced that with my title and the systemic approach. Unfortunately, we need more than two eyes on these nutrient management topics because they're not just that it's someone wants to talk regenerative ag soil health oh phosphorus leaking from the residue but i'm trying to bury carbon and save the planet do you don't want me to do that any longer and also won't i encourage infiltration of water with regenerative ag practices well yes you could and that's why we're back to the topic of trade-offs and so forth and why we have to be nimble uh, and take a systemic approach uh, without losing the uh, yeah the details when we need to about trying to drive towards a solution of, or a series of practice solutions to address a particular concern like surface water quality. Jason or Mike? I think that kind of again goes to the root of, of why we had this workshop in the first place is because of these per perceived competing uh, um, benefits of BMPs and uh, the need to get it right, you know, before we start making broad recommendations to, to farmers and ranchers out there. Because if we get it wrong, we, we kind of have one chance to get this thing right. And if we get it wrong, uh, we've lost all credibility with the farming community in the basin. Agreed. At least we've acknowledged that we've got quite a bit figured out. We don't have it all figured out. And I think collectively, 
we're all careful now in what we're saying while still saying something definitive and useful, right, Jason, about the science, but just being careful to have the right nuance to it, that we have to try to reconcile these trade-offs while still talking straight to farmers, but we might as well tell them, hey, this is pretty messed up, but it's, in, it's fascinating. Work with us to, to try to wrestle this alligator because, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heck of a conundrum. Jason? Yeah, well said, both of you. I think uh, the, the idea is we, we recognize all these great things that could happen from regenerative agriculture, but do we know for sure that nutrient uh, loss reduction will be one of them, especially phosphorus? No, and I think we just have to acknowledge that all these other great things could result, but if your main objective is for um, nutrient loss reduction, especially phosphorus, we just have to recognize this might not be the, the only answer for you. Yes, we might have to come back to the concept of net benefit, like a lot of choices in life. I have to overlay some things and decide, is it this job or go do this fun thing and sacrifice something else? We have to come up with a net benefit in terms of agri-ecosystem sustainability, unless, yes, it's clear cut. Oh, look at this dirty water running off. Well, we stopped the soil erosion. We've accomplished a lot, but it, there's, it seems a, a lot more nuanced to, to most of the basin, which is what's, yeah, what's led to this, uh, this ongoing conversation. Yep. Well, I just, I just want to thank you all so much. I did, um, the, David Spidell had a, a story that he posted to the panelists just about some of the extreme, you know, challenges that can happen for farmers as well as the environment, uh, the environment when, um, you know, we're not managing these systems in a, a systems kind of holistic way. So th thank you, David, um, for that story. And uh, I just, I'm gonna share my screen for the last time again. And just really wanna thank, thank our panelists again, Mike L, Jason Ben Robes and, and Mitchell Timmerman uh, with their contact information there. You can obviously look them up um, through Google or your search engine of choice. Uh, Cause I know there's a lot that we, a lot of probably remaining questions and the great information in that report in the fact sheets. Um, and, Please uh, take all of our panelists up on the, the valuable potential next steps for the Red River Basin and nutrient management in cold climates, because um, there's a lot more we have to learn um, and we wanna be learning, learning and acting together. So thank you for participating today. Um, you can go to our website, northcentralwater.org to look at the, to access the webinar archive. Um, we have talked about soil health and we do have a, you know, south of the border here, we have our soil health nexus team uh, that has a, another upcoming webinar on uh, agricultural policy and how it uh, impacts soil health practice adoption. So that's next Wednesday, uh, April 21st at 2 p.m. Central Time at North no soilhealthnexus.org. So thanks again so much uh, to all of you for joining us and uh, very best, very best wishes for you as the spring continues to unfold.